boys. Thanks for coming on. We've got Jimmy Bureau's back. Uh, did one of my first uh, mates to come on my podcast in the second episode. Hey, Jimmy. Happy to be back, Oz. And Boydie, we've um, we've had a few chats recently about coming on the pod, mate. Um, it's good to have you on. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, brother. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. So, we'll obviously, you know, you're wearing the jerseys and that's the main topic. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit of footy stuff. Uh, Boydie, what, what have you been up to over the last couple of weeks, mate, during these uh, these pretty weird times of... Has it been, you know, living with Normia, we've had, he's had a bit of a routine, a training program. You've been keeping up to date with all your stuff at the Roosters? Yeah, uh, it's going well, mate. Um, you know, obviously got a, a little bit of a setup in the backyard and doing what you can to get by. I mean, you know, it was obviously... The NRL is going to be working hard with getting back as soon as possible. And, you know, once there was a bit of clarity around that, I think it was um, it was really good mentally. I think, you know, Jamie can touch on it as well. Just, um, you know, knowing what to look forward to and, and something to work forward to. So, um, look, it's been good like that. Been doing a little bit here and there just to get by, stay fit. And, yeah, can't wait to get back and see the boys. As uh, one of, you know, obviously the captain of your club and one of the leaders of the game of... Has the game been in um, close contact with yourself and some of the other senior players throughout this time, just keeping you up to date with everything that's going on? Yeah, look, the Players Association's been awesome and uh, working really closely with the NRL. Uh, Luke Keary, for us, has been enormous with, um, you know, reaching in, diving into all of that stuff and and getting all the information that we can get, uh, just so I've got a lot of clarity around it. There's obviously heaps of... Heaps of little things that we have to um, get through and, and look past to to um, obviously get the show back on the road. But um, uh, Jamie will probably touch on it too. He's working really close as well. That you know the NRL and the Players Association are working really well together. Yeah. So Jimmy, yeah, on to you, mate. Um, from your end, Ben, you know, with your new role at the RLPA, um, what's that look for, like for you for the last couple of weeks? Well, I know you've been flat out. Um, are those dates uh, that were tossed around about May 28th, is that a possibility? Um, what's it looking like from your end, mate? Yeah, mate, it's certainly a possibility. Uh, from our end, um, we're cautiously optimistic. There's obviously a lot of, uh, as Boyd had touched on, there's some questions that need to be answered moving forward. Um, we're just confident the relationship we've got with the NRL uh, at the moment um, and other key stakeholders in the clubs and obviously the player engagement they had. Boyd has been on plenty of calls too. We feel like we're going to work towards a solution fairly quickly, but obviously there's some key considerations in around what um, I suppose the broadcast stuff looks like. Uh, obviously, player safety, you know, is paramount. You know, can we guarantee that? Um, you know, and and obviously the season structure. We've got the Warriors interstate team, so there's there's a lot of questions that need to be answered, um, and we're confident, you know, in good time, and um, we can get those done. As I said, cautiously up. Op- cautiously optimistic about uh, May 28. We all want the footy back. We're all working towards it. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed at this point. The the one point that stood out there that you mentioned, the competition, which was sort of tossed around a little bit, the competition can't go ahead without the Warriors, surely. So that would be, you know, number one on your agenda as, as well, part of the RLPA, making sure the Warriors are part of this if this goes ahead. Yeah, so we've been in constant contact with the Warriors, obviously, Ben. You know, one of 16, you know, key key stakeholders within the game. Clubs, obviously, they've got some different uh, restrictions on them. There's going to be a lot more potentially asked of them to come over and continue to push forward in the season. So it's important that, you know, we get some clarity for them as soon as possible. That all kind of tapers into the, the same, you know, some of these unanswered questions. Um, and when I say unanswered, it's not that we're not being given any clear picture, that these are just things that we need to work through you know, over the next you know, week or so. Um, you know, a lot of meetings, Project Apollo, um, you know, obviously those meetings are, are going to be big in determining that, but also just ensuring that there's some good conversations happening with the Warriors so that you know, we're doing the best we can to support them through whatever that may look like for them. So, um, yeah, there's a bit of water going to the bridge, but um, we feel like, um, you know, as you said, you know, we want the competition, we want the Warriors in it. That's that's what we all want. So, I think um, yeah. you got to you got to look at the the Queensland teams too. You know, they're sort of in a similar boat where they're looking at coming down for an extended period of time, like away from their family. So, you know, we we definitely want the Warriors involved, and we want to look after them. But at the same token, we got to look after the the Brisbane team and also Melbourne as well, just to sort them out. 
was is the leadership up in Queensland? Were they um, is she been quite um, hard on her stance with regards to opening up the borders and whatnot, and and looking towards Origin as well? Is that right? Was that uh, the, at least uh, at least publicly? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, look, with all due respect, obviously, the, the, there's no way the NRL would make assumptions um, on a season without proper consultation. Um, yeah. I think you know, the, the May 28 was always a date, as Boydo said, to provide a bit of clarity for the players, for the clubs, for the fans. To Ideally, that's what we want to work towards. And then hopefully get the questions sooner rather than later answered. Um, and, and some of those questions are obviously going to be speaking with government officials. I know the NRL... I've been working closely um, with government officials um, to get that clearance. So you know, once things were looking like a, a go, um, those conversations, particularly with Queensland government, would certainly go ahead. Um, you know, the hope is, you know, obviously, contingencies need to be made for, as Boyd, I said, those interstate teams, potential restrictions, you know, border restrictions. Um, but the hope is with, um, I suppose, the rates of infection continuing to drop, you know, those border uh, restrictions may well ease by May 28. And then it takes away a bit more of that <coughs> concern. So, yeah, again, we've got a plan for that. And obviously, um, you know, they're, um, they're, they're um, I suppose, in a much different boat to the Sydney teams where it sounds like we're going to be able to maintain some normality. Um, but ideally, we get those border restrictions lifted and um, we can kind of, you know, obviously, focus on supporting the Warriors as best we can and getting these games going. Yeah, um, yeah, it's unreal. We're, to be fair, we, we come on. That's a, some good good stuff in the NRL there. But we're we've really come on to talk a bit of NFL, haven't we, boys? So let's, let's stuff, hey, yeah. I, can, I can see the, I can see the smile on your faces from from here to here, boys. Big news. Um, it was obviously massive news about two weeks ago now. Um, you've got Tom Brady. He's come over the Buccaneers, uh, which was big enough as a, you know by itself. But he's brought his mate Gronkowski. Um, first, first reactions, thoughts. Uh, as long, yeah. you know, I know you're both. Actually, Jimmy, we've we've spoken to you about you know how you started as a Bucks fan. Boydie, when did you when did you first become a Bucks fan? Yeah, so it all it started back from when um so my junior club back home is the Old Bar Pirates, and we have a similar emblem to the Buccaneers. So it started back then. I had a had a soft spot for the Bucks back when I was I don't know probably about ten. 12 years old, but I really didn't start to get into NFL until um, we drafted uh, Famous, and then um, <laughs> and then once once um, we'll get once, into him. Um, we'll speak yeah. we'll about him. Normie yeah, was once, calling me Famous Jameis the other day. <laughs> <laughs> that hurt me. Yeah. Um, and then once like the NFL and ESPN took off in Australia, um, that's when I got into it more. And then it wasn't until obviously. Um, you get introduced to fantasy football and then it changes your whole life. So, look, I've been a Bucks fan for, for a fair while now. But, yeah, it was, it was pretty um, optimistic about, um, you know, the last couple of seasons. Jamie will touch on it. As a Bucks fan, like, I don't know, the last couple of seasons, I was like, you get a really good feeling at the start of the year just because, you know, like, the, the weapons that we have on offense and then um, the, the previous drafts of you know, just stacking up on defence. So, you know, but, um, an extra year of experience for them boys and then you're just praying and fingers crossed that Famous will pull his finger out and stop turning the ball over. But, um, you know, even the games are lost over the last couple of years. They've been like 35 to 33. And, you know, you just think it's because, like, we're turning the ball over too much. So... It's still you know, going. It's still going. Yeah. Yeah, drafting Aguero in the second round. Oh, <laughs> wow. What's doing, but a What a clanger. So, Jimmy, yeah, got the so, goat now, you, so. Oh, sorry, buddy. Yeah, you Go got on, the mate. goat. Go Jimmy, does that make you legit contenders now with, with Gronk and the goat? Yeah, I think it does. I think we've we've touched on this. It's look, Brady is who he is at this at this age. He was um if we can get that twenty-four to eight touchdown interception ratio that he had at the Pats. You bring that leadership and a bit of that knowledge, you know, to all those receiving threats and that O-line. That's all we need. You know, we just, we've got an ascending D. Obviously, ideally, we pick up some some quality picks in the draft. Um, and we just come in on the back of just confidence, having some confidence to kind of attack it. I think 
that's all we need. We don't need the Brady, the 50 touchdown Brady. Um, we'll take the 24 and eight um, to just kind of just get us through. Um, and I say that with all due respect, but just having him, um, yeah, I think it does. I think it, it does push us into that contender bracket. As Boyd, I said every every year, I, I normally put a bet on that we're going to win the yeah. win the conference. So it's not like I'm not always optimistic, but let's just say I'm a lot more optimistic now. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jimmy, you touched on leadership from Tom Brady. You're not going to miss famous Jameis's pre-game leadership speeches, are you? Uh, <laughs> when he's uh, eating those I just, W's. I just. <laughs> Has he got? Is he, get, is, he get, is he getting some honest feedback from his friendship circle or what? You reckon? No. Like no. some of the oh, no. some of the some of the workout tapes, some of the speeches. It's just like, geez, man. Like he needs a good friend to just pull him. Like, come here, man. Let's have a chat yeah. about this. So the thing with that as well, like um, you see that he always threw like picks, but he also. Uh, a few of them come off too. Like, I had him on my bench in fantasy a couple of times. And there was games where you'd have, like, 40 points, but four interceptions as well. It's unheard of. Like, he was still fantasy relevant. Yeah, yeah. Like, and he'll just keep, like, backing himself, throwing them deep balls to Mike Evans or Goldwyn. But, you know, with Brady coming in, he's going to be more calculated. So, you probably won't get a lot of them deep balls. But you'll see a lot of, um, a lot of the plays being open, especially with Gronk coming in having Goblin there, who's a beast. And then obviously, you know what Mike Evans can do too. What do you think with the emergent of Gronk, uh, Boydie? Do you think they move on from either Bright or AJ Howard? I think uh, the talk is, I wouldn't know, mate, but apparently they're trying to uh, shop OJ Howard around. Um, but yeah, obviously having Gronk there, there'd be no point with having three tight ends, you'd think. Yeah. yeah. We, from we a spoke about it this morning, well. Jimmy. Yeah, Sorry, Jim, from a cap ahead. standpoint as well, you're not going to want. I think um, Brates restructured at four mil or something like that. Um, yeah, you know you got AJ three and a half. Does does Gronk come with the same wage he was on before, or does it re- like is it a new a new contract started? I'm not sure, but still, I wonder if, the, I wonder if they're want. able to renegotiate that. Yeah, you're not going to want to. Plus, you know, you're going to be able to get some draft capital for one of those. You know, it may not be. You know, OJ. I think they want a second rounder. Now with Gronk on board, they might be lucky to get a third, probably a fourth, yeah. like Bright. But then you could also look to package, you know, one of them in a trade up if you want to make sure you get one of the top four offensive tackles. So I think you only need two. They've got all Claire's, like the blocking tight end as well. I don't think we need like one of them is going to have to be the odd man out moving forward. Yeah, yeah you touch on you touch on the draft a little bit there, Jimbo. Is that is that who you want to see in draft now with? What pick he's got? 13 or 14 around that range? 14. 14. 14. Yeah. 14. You're looking, you're yeah, looking at me. a couple of those tackles. Um, for, for me, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think... You might get uh, the pipe and slip to you. Well, that's the thing. It, it wouldn't... The only reason... I think Beckton's a beast, but having the big body one, we've already got Donovan Smith, who's like the big body that we tried to transform into a bit of a dance and bear tackle. He was always a good tackle. He's a, he's a good tackle, but he's not an elite tackle. So I wouldn't mind them if they can somehow get Andrew Thomas play it safe with someone who's a bit of a technician. Um, but I don't like our chances of standing pat at 14 and getting one of those top four. Uh, I think if we stand pat, maybe move back and get, I think, Josh Jones. It's probably that fifth mm-hmm. tackle potentially. Um, or you gave him further back and you get that, um, is it Urza or something? Urza? Something uh, Cleveland there. Ezra. Um, yeah, I think Ezra. there's that Austin Jackson from USC as well. He's a little bit, he's been mocked. Yeah. I think to us at the Packers at thirty before. Yeah. So, so I think I think that's that's the area of need for us at the moment. You know, among others, I think running backs another one, particularly pass catching. But you can move back later in the draft and get you know quality ones of them can get maybe yeah, a cam. Maybe like round two. But I was thinking like when you have a look at Brady and what he's had like in his backfield um, at the Pats. You look at James White. I don't think we have anything like that in the backfield at the box. So we've got. I reckon I've seen enough from uh, Ronald Jones that he's going to take that next step. Like, he can be yeah. like a power back, like, just get by. But then, like, you need to look at someone to get, like, James White, where, you know, that was one of his biggest threats, I think, like, in the last few years at the Pats there with um, with Brady. So, maybe Jonathan Taylor. He, he looks like maybe the best pass catcher in the draft. But, um, yeah, you can you can afford to wait, I think, on running backs there. But... Probably, yeah, yeah the offensive so. line, but even another edge rusher, maybe, a pass rusher. 
Yeah. I yeah, think um, there's a couple there's a couple of good ones. Like even a late round one, I think his name's Gibson. He's like a wide receiver, running back hybrid and yeah. returns kicks. Like someone that you can bring in on the third down that's just gonna catch everything. Um because yeah, I'm with Boydy. Um so ideally think, you'd um, like if you missed out Jones, probably to trade back Jimbo if you missed out on those one yeah, of those three or four best guys. Tackles. Yeah, I think so. I think I think um yeah, I, I'd be content. Last year, didn't we? I think we've we've always moved back and never moved up. Yeah. See, I wouldn't be against I wouldn't be against packaging one of the tight ends and moving in the top ten and securing one of the top four tackles. I think we're not that far away from being a finished project. I think the O line, particularly that right um, right tackle, um, is an area of need for us. I think we've got Joe Haig from I'm not sure where he was, but I think it might have been the Colts. He's probably a, a reasonable player, but if you want to. I suppose move forward with a good bookend for Donovan Smith, and I think we move up for a tackle. Mm. Yeah, um, we touched on him before. Famous Jameis, um, still currently on the market. Does he? <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> um, speaking of your jerseys, too, by the way, Boydie, and you know I'm, I'm good, I've become good mates with Jakey Miller over in um, when yeah. my time at Wakey. I think he's still got one of your Bucks jerseys over there too. Oh, really? Nicked off with it, did he? Yeah, I think. It's, <laughs> I think you might have been maybe 11 or 12 years old and he's just fitting it now. So, um, yeah. I think around in that all the time. Um, <laughs> yeah, where do, where do you reckon he ends up, boys? Um, where, would, where would you, you know, because you've followed him for a while, would, do you actually want him to succeed at another team or would you like to see him succeed if he went to a team and backed up a starter and, and tried to earn a starting spot? Well, yeah, selfish as it sounds, like, You'd probably want him to stay and learn under the go, but like it probably won't happen. He's still young. I think he's only like 25 or 26. Um, he's got all the tools. He just like he just doesn't learn. Like he just can't help himself. You know, every year we say the same thing, but um, yeah, look, or even like I'm not sure if you would agree, but even going up to like Green Bay and just learning under someone like Aaron Rodgers and and some like that. I mean, it's a he's a perfect backup. Um, he's he's well qualified, but yeah, at this point, I don't know where he's going to end up. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to agree. I think Jameis is who he is. I think if you got five years as a starting quarterback, um, you know, you're not you're not changing in a hurry. Um, I think the best thing for him is a backup spot. Obviously, you can go somewhere like the Jags, potentially Washington, and kind of push, you know, any you know their current starters. Um, particularly if Washington don't go quarterback in this draft. But I think the best bet for him, and we spoke about this, I really like to the Steelers. I think um, yeah, you know, I like back, up to, big, back yeah. up to Big Ben. They're very similar quarterbacks. Obviously, Big Ben doesn't turn over nearly as much as Jameis has, but you know they're both kind of downfield offenses. Um, and uh, just sitting behind Big Ben for a year or two, I also like the the Packers like um, you know, behind your mate, um, Big A Rod, and um, I suppose just. Just sitting for a year or two, and I suppose, um, and trying to see if he can learn from his mistakes. But you know, if you're asking me, I think um, at year five, I think I think you are who you are, whether that's Blake Bottles or you know uh, or not. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, remains to be seen. I think the same question that sort of like thinking about lately is Cam Newton too, like former MVP, mm. you know, and just like sort of say, where's he going to end up? Yeah. Well, maybe his is a little bit different because he probably sees it. He, I wonder if he still, like, he probably would still view himself as a starting quarterback. So I think there's, they've yeah. come out and said that he's waiting to see what happens in the draft. He doesn't want to go to a maybe a yeah, potential LA Chargers and they draft Tour or Justin Herbert and he's, yeah. he's the mentor, he's the one year stop guy. He wants to go to a team where he's going to be the guy still, which is maybe wishful thinking, like you said, considering how yeah. good he was, maybe three or four years ago, he has been banged up for the last couple of years. Um, I think um, yeah. I can see, I think he's a good option still. Like, I wouldn't mind seeing him. Yeah. I think that charges D, uh, you know, and some of the weapons they got in, you know, like, if they miss out on the top quarterback or decide to go one of the tackles instead and, you yeah, picking up Cam, um, Cam to kind of challenge um, Tyrod, I think that's a good move. I wouldn't mind seeing him at Patriots as well. Like, I, I really wouldn't mind seeing the Patriots not be good for a while. Yeah. But, um, you know, I can see him potentially going there. Um, 
you know, and being part of a bit of a, an underdog Patriots, I suppose an underdog Patriots we haven't seen for a while. But, um, mm. yeah, I think I think Cam's going to have more of a market than Jameis, uh, despite some of the injuries and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, we haven't. I wasn't really even going to speak about that, but it's a good point, Jimmy. With the the Pat side of it, do you think uh, do you think the the ball keeps rolling over there at the Pats and business as usual? Because I don't know much about this Stidham guy. I didn't. I you know I I try to do my best work on a few of the younger quarterbacks coming through in the draft, but I only sort of sit around that you know top two or three guys, four max. Um, you know, even looking at guys like Jordan Love this year, that's probably as far as I go back. And just kind of sort of look at the rankings. So I didn't, I didn't really know too much about Stidham. Have you? Do you know much about yeah. him, or how do you think the Pats will handle handle? Um, I think Stidham. Yeah, I think I think it'd be uh, it'd be bad business if the Pats didn't add another quarterback. Um, I just don't. I don't know if you want to put all your eggs in, you know, the Stidham basket. I think he's shown that he was capable uh, um, in the preseason and he might have played a little bit of spot relief when the Pats were in front by a 1,000. Um, and, and he's obviously proved capable within the organisation. They're all saying the right things, but um, you got him and, and they've got the backup. He's been just about everywhere. Um, oh, yeah. What is He's still there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like he's a solid backup, but he, he he is who he is at this point in time. So I think I think the Pats are probably going to add another quarterback. I don't know who that is, but I think they'll probably give Stidham, you know, the the first opportunity unless they sign a Cam. Um, but yeah, I'd imagine they'll be adding someone potentially in the draft. I wonder if there's going to be a Patriots documentary ten or fifteen years down the line, and I'm and I'm sort of segueing into the MJ doc okay, there, boys. If you haven't noticed it. I'm getting more experience, yeah. so I'm getting good at things like that. Boy, have you, did you see the doco? Um, yeah, mate. Yeah. yeah, couldn't wait. Like, obviously, with the build-up and that, and then seeing it posted everywhere on social media. But, yeah, couldn't wait to watch it. Um, yeah, it was just so good. Like, it, it just lives up to everything, all the expectation. Like, you can just tell from the first two episodes what it's going to be like. And you just, like, you could have sat there and watched all ten episodes easy, but... Easy. Just like you can just tell he's different, eh? Like he's a different cat. He's, it's so good to watch. What with? So I don't want to give too much away because Jimmy's just sitting there smoking because he oh, hasn't yeah, seen that. Yeah, yeah, no, but that's all right. Jimmy, Jimmy oh, yeah, knows no, the, the, pod, the podcast has to, But I'll just say one thing that me and Normie spoke about when we're watching it is just you know how much of a big dog he was in his second year when he was like, yeah. that was sort of like half wanting to tank to get better draft picks. And he's like, fuck that. Like, I'm not going to bring a losing culture into um, into this organisation. I'm not about that. And you just you yeah. just see that's like, that's a mentality of a winner. And that's, you, you can yeah. sort of see he is the way he is. Yes. Like you said, from a young age, what I got out of from like the, one of the biggest like, stories that I took from it was when he was injured, like going and seeing the doctors and they're like, look, if you go back and play, you know, you, you could do it again. And if you do this injury again, you're probably done. And he's like, look, I don't care. Like, fuck, let's, let's do it. And then the club was pulling him back. So we went and seen, like, obviously um, the, the coach and the GM was like, oh, look, can I go home for a while? Just so he was out of their hair. And then he ended up playing one-on-one, two-on-two with his boys <laughs> back home that he played college with. And then he was playing, like, full games, like, back home, like, on this, like, foot that wasn't even meant to be, like, run on yet. Then yeah. he's come back and he's carving up a train. They're like, what are you doing? What have you done? And he's like, see, yeah. I fucking told you. Just let me go. And then come back. And like you said, when what about um that uh when they come up against the Celtics in the playoffs? Oh, great. And they just scraped in when they let him play. And then he scored 52, I think it was, the first game. And then the next game scored 60-something. And they lost both games. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, just I'm, goes to I'm, show his mentality, eh? I'm looking forward to, to seeing some more of those clashes in particular. Um, hopefully, we didn't give too much away for you there, Jimbo, but um, I'm looking <laughs> forward to on. those early Quiet. clashes between um, the Boston Celtics, obviously, and then how he rolls through. And I think he was on the documentary, the Detroit uh, Pistons documentary, when they talked about the Bad Boys documentary that they had. And... And they yeah. just bullied the hell out of Jordan back in those days. So that's when he sort of realised that he Dennis Rodman was a part of that team. And then he, yeah. they ended up drafting Scotty Pippen and then brought Dennis Rodman over. So, yeah, looking forward to it. We uh, Like I said, we won't try to ruin it for Jimmy. Jimmy's just sitting there politely 
But um, right, that's right. thanks for coming on, boys. That was that was awesome. Just it was good to get your reactions. I think I'll be moving forward a bit more like this. So if you ever came to come back on with some uh, some Bucks news, I'm I'm pretty Bucks sure it'll chat. be a hot topic leading forward. So thanks for coming Bucks on, boys. Chat. Sweet. Cheers, Adam. Thanks, mate. Sweet, boys. Here we go.